Hello, I'm Kristen Perrin with the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, and I'm excited to welcome you to our panel discussion on increasing diversity within the talent pipeline. I have a couple of housekeeping items before we get started today. We do have closed captioning available for this session. You'll need to enable the multimedia view that is located towards the bottom right of your screen to utilize that feature. Additionally, we will be able to take your questions throughout the panel discussion. So please send them our way using the Q&A feature also located towards the bottom right of your screen. This afternoon, I have the honor of introducing our esteemed moderator and panel members. The bios for this phenomenal group is available on our event site. However, we would like to introduce them a little differently today. We've asked each panel member to answer two questions. What brought you to work in the DEI space? And what's the one thing you hope to see from your efforts in the DEI space? I'll share their answers as I introduce them. First, we have Colette Campbell, the Chief Talent Acquisition and Diversity Officer for Bremer Bank. Colette's role at Bremer feels like a culmination of her experience in leadership, management, and human resources, as well as her previous roles, which foundationally prepared her for her current role. She believes the financial sector is lucrative and overwhelmingly underrepresented by people of color. There is room and a need for greater representation, she says. She is, she is thrilled to be able to do what she loves in a sector that has tremendous opportunity for growth and diverse representation. Colette hopes to see an increase in representation of women, people with different abilities, people of color, and the banking pipeline in general but particularly in managerial and senior leadership roles. Greg Cunningham is the Senior Executive Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer for U.S. Bank. Greg believes you spend your entire life in search of your purpose and your why. He states he was fortunate enough to recognize that doing DEI was the alignment of passion, values, and purpose. It's an important step in his journey. He hopes first, first and foremost that his organization fulfills its promise to all its stakeholders and that our nation finally has a greater awareness and literacy around our history and the potential of a shared, more equitable future. future. Kianga Lee is the Vice President of Administrative Operations for the Independent Community Bankers of America. Kianga brings a unique perspective to our panel. Although she doesn't work directly in the DEI space, she knows the value and importance of the work through her personal experience. She says without two of her leaders mentoring, coaching, and pushing her along the way, she doesn't think she'd be where she is today. Kianga hopes more minorities will think banking as a real career opportunity and be inspired to become bank presidents and CEOs. Additionally, she hopes more bank leaders will spend time mentoring and coaching minorities so they can get to higher executive level positions. And last but certainly not least, we have Keebler Santos, who's the Senior Executive Vice President, Head of Diverse Segments, Representation and Inclusion at Wells Fargo. Keebler's passion for making corporate America a more inclusive environment and the opportunity to deeply understand and better serve diverse customers across lines of business brought him to the DEI space. And he hopes that underrepresented employees at Wells Fargo feel seen, heard and embraced. I would like to thank each of our panelists and our moderator for being with us today. I will now turn the event over to Latoya Lewis, Vice President of Innovation at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago and one of the steering committee co-chairs for the Financial Services Pipeline Initiative, a collaboration of Chicagoland financial services firms focused on increasing the representation of Latino and African Americans in the financial sector. Latoya. Thank you, Kristen. Welcome everybody. And I am honored to get to spend some time in discussion with Colette, Greg, Clever, and Kianga. So let's get underway. In light of recent events, what actions have you or your organization taken? And how, if at all, has it differed from your past focus? We'll start with you, Colette, interested in your perspectives. Sure. Well, like everybody, there was all of a sudden, everyone was aware, you know, um, after the, the death of George Floyd and made a lot of different announcements, including us. And this time, um, though, we our, our mission at Bremer Bank is 
this idea of cultivating thriving communities. And so knowing that not all communities are thriving, how do we do something different with, than just words? And so we, we took, took a couple different approaches. One was thinking about our, our inward focus and the accountability, not only of our, of our HR leaders, but of our leaders in general. What is, what is this going to mean and how are we going to, to do some things different? And so we invested in some leadership and in some strategic areas that really um, we're gonna speak to not only the acquisition of talent, but also the work of, of DEI. Um, our, our, our bank is um, really passionate about affordable housing and we've got, we are the largest partner for Habitat for Humanity, but in Minneapolis, knowing that we've got the largest uh, home ownership gap, what are we doing to, to, to um, really think about that and affordable housing for, for our black um, black families. And so there's, there's a lot of different things, but, but I would say that, uh, the intentionality and the, the investment of resources for people to, to do the work that is needed is, um, is, has been, has been really, uh, apparent. We've also established, um, we're probably one of the smaller banks that are on this panel today, but we didn't have a diversity council. So establishing, again, and, and expanding that ownership of this work beyond just one person or a team, but to the greater organization, as well as um, thinking about diversity in terms of who we're partnering with business. And so being really expansive and intentional about that. Greg, how has US Bank thought about this? Um, thank you, uh, Latoya, first and foremost, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, Latoya, I guess I would describe our efforts um, really in three in, in three buckets. And I think number one, um, you know, as an organization like everyone else, um, you know, we made a, a number of public commitments last year. Um, but I think what has been most important for us was not only you know these public commitments, which were so prominent in corporate America, um, but to really make sure that those commitments turn to action. And in February, we launched um, what we call the Access Commitment, which was a bank-wide um, initiative to help close um, the racial wealth gap. Um, and the reason I, um, I bring that up, and, and I think it's important, is because as a bank, you know, we're not experts in social justice and racial justice. And, you know, and I think what has been critical for us was to really think about what our core competency was as a financial institution and how we could bring our expertise to help solve these bigger problems. The racial wealth gap, which currently stands at eight to one for uh, black households, um, white households versus black households, is not a black issue. It's an American issue. Um, it's a drag on the US economy as a whole. It actually impacts every single one of us as Americans in terms of our household income. And so we're standing up a number of initiatives across the entire bank um, to really address that. The second thing that I think is important um, was this, this, this notion of none of us on this call, none of our organizations on this call can do it alone. Um, we have to collaborate, we have to partner, and we have to have scale. And so one of the examples that we did here in the Twin Cities uh, actually involves um, the organizations of two of my colleagues on the phone, uh, both Bremer and Wells Fargo. Um, we know here in Minneapolis that we are going to need an entire ecosystem, a new ecosystem of financial services that serves the black community and helps drive economic mobility. So we actually all partnered um, Bremer, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and Huntington Bank to bring a black owned bank to the Twin Cities. Um, because we know that we need big banks, we need black banks, we need credit unions, we need this whole ecosystem to serve the community. And so this notion of partnership and collaboration is important. And then the third area, Latoya, I would say, has really been the focus on our employees, right? And I think that's true for every single one of us is to make to make sure we were taking care of home. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're doing, um, some of it is not new, but I think we've really intensified leadership efforts. Um, you know, many of us joined the McKinsey Leadership Academy for, uh, for Black, Hispanic, and Asian employees. Um, but I think what's important about our employee efforts is, you know, this work can't be about how we fix black people or how we fix our Latino uh, employees or how we fix women. Uh, we actually need to train all of our managers on how to lead inclusively. 
And so we've really doubled down in making sure that all of our managers of people understand how to lead inclusively. And then the accountability measure is it's part of everybody's performance review. So those are just a couple of things that I think um, we've really sort of doubled down over the last you know 18 months or so. Clever, can you share insights about how Wells Fargo is thinking about this? Yes, a, um, I, I don't know if I have a whole lot to add from what uh, my, my two previous colleagues said it incredibly well, but I think, you know, at one hand, the, 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 the death of George Floyd was a, was a game changer, right? It, it, I think it really caught the attention of parts of society that were not paying attention before. On the other hand, sadly, it had to take the death of a, of a human being for that attention and that spotlight to be shed on this important issue. As it relates to Wells Fargo, I think two or three things ended up being different as a result of all of the conversations that happened internally in the wake of George Floyd's uh, death. Number one was the creation of my role, by creating a role that can integrate all of the diversity initiatives across employees, suppliers, and customer segments into one single role, especially in a company as large and distributed as Wells Fargo, some consistency becomes really, really important. So we are not scattered all over the place and not getting any type of scale on the initiatives. Secondly, was the elevation of that role to the operating committee. So I report directly uh, to Charlie, to our CEO, and uh, therefore, I have the, the, the ears of my peers. Those of you that know me know that I'm not very shy, so I tend to advocate very strongly for uh, GNI efforts. And I also report to the board like very frequently. So that creates a relevance to the effort that I think, I think is important. And as Greg said it incredibly well, I think we also have been looking at areas where we can bring our scale and that we feel like we have a responsibility to make a difference. And home ownership is one of them. We have uh, uh, large commitments for home ownership increases in the Latino community, in the African-American community. We also have recently unveiled a 10-year effort, which we call banking inclusion initiatives to try to bring Latino, Native Americans, and African-American households into the banking system. In some cases, by originating the accounts on our own, in some cases by supporting Black-owned um, um, fintechs like MochaFi or Greenwood, which we are investors of both, and in some cases, to Greg's point, investing in MGIs, because uh, in, 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 it takes a village, and therefore, we none of us can do that on our own, and having those partnerships have been very helpful as well. Kianga? perspective? Yep. Um, so for those of that don't know, ICBA is a national banking association that advocates for community banks, specifically for community banks. So when regulators and congressional members are trying to write policies and legislation, we try to make sure that we're considering that community bank perspective. Um, so, and, and I just wanted to set the stage for, you know, why I'm on the panel and who, I, and who we are and, and the things that we do. But um, in preparation for this panel, I interviewed some of our members, and we have over 5,000 community banks, and um, I wanted to see what they were doing in their area. Um, but first, I'll talk a little bit about our organization. So one of the first things um, I can tell you is that our president took the lead in all of this. And, you know, while that social unjust, social unrest was going on, um, one of the first things that she did was send out an email to check on everyone to make sure that we were all doing well, um, to get um, see how we were feeling. And the next thing that she did was um, we formed some work groups. And in these work groups, um, she really divided them up into three groups. And we attacked this problem from, you know, what's going on inside of our organization? What are we going to do in our communities? and then um, what we do to support our industry. And I just wanted to go through a few of those things. So inside of our own organization, um, one of the things that we're doing right now is um, we're in the process of interviewing organizations to partner with to uh, create a DEI strategy. 
Um, and then we also have done some DEI training and education. Um, I've noticed that we are hiring folks from different backgrounds. Um, we're looking at performing assessments on compensation as it relates to women and people of color. And then we're also making sure that our board of directors um, and you know, our leadership committees have more diversity on them as well. So what we're doing in our community, um, we're now partnering with more organizations. Um, so DC Scores, which teaches kids to play soccer, soccer and poetry and writing. And then um, we're also partnering with another organization called Patriots, which gets minorities involved in STEM programs. And then what we're doing in our industry, as I mentioned before, is we really are um, recruiting bankers who are from a variety of different uh, backgrounds to serve on our leadership boards. Um, so in our publications, we're looking at all of our publications to make sure it has more representation there. Um, and then we're also making sure that there are there's more representation um, on the regulatory front. So, you know, the CFPB and the OCC both have advisory, advisory committees. And this year we've been able to put um, a Native American banker on the committee. And we've also um, put an African American banker up there as well. So just to go over a little things that I've seen in the industry, um, first I see that community banks are willing to have this conversation. Um, and, you know, they're acknowledging that you know, there's not a lot of diversity in, the, in their banks and they're being more transparent about it and they're doing more um, statistical analysis about where they stand with, um, you know, as it relates to this DEI initiative. And they're, they're providing more education and training. And then um, they're also creating more departments and positions. I've seen CEOs that are pledging to commit to diversifying their workforce. They're creating small libraries, small, small DEI libraries. And then I've even seen them go on retreats where, um, you know, they have team building activities and they're sharing diverse uh, diversity stories. Um, and then one last thing, I, I also see the state banking associations are um, paying more attention to this now and they're creating DEI web pages with resources for community banks to access um, best practices, exchange stories, and things of that sort. So. so thank you all for that. It's very clear uh, from your comments that it, you know it takes a village. There's certainly an, an ecosystem element to this um, and that there are uh, many ways to approach trying to address this problem. So clearly uh, comprehensive and holistic things are being thought about. So Kianga, staying with you, what are some of the tools and approaches your organizations are using to connect with and engage diverse talent, which is something that, you know, historically many leaders have said is, is difficult? Um, from a recruiting perspective, um, the banks have stressed to me that it's really important to build relationships um, with organizations in their community um, because they serve as the touch points for um, a variety of diverse people. So they're reaching out to the nonprofits, the community development entities, civic organizations, such as uh, the Black or Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Um, they're reaching out to business groups now, Black accountants. Um, and then there's, a, of course, the veterans and disability organizations and churches and fairs. Um, I've also became aware of their, their partnering with BankWorks. And this is um, an organization that helps adults from low income communities um, get into the banking um, banking area. And so it's a free eight week career training course. And then afterwards, they actually um, place these people in banks with jobs. Um, so that's that's one of the things that I see. And then I also see that there's, they're reaching out to the local HBCUs. Um, they're implementing the Rooney rule. Um, I don't want to steal everyone's answers, <laughs> so I'll, I'll let someone else go. <laughs> Colette, your thoughts? Yeah, so adding, a, 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 you know, echoing a lot of what um, my colleague just said before, but this question kind of feels like, you know, when you think about connecting with diverse talent, it's it, it's it's twofold. It's both like who your talent is inside the organization internally and then um, who's outside externally, because I think for for our bank anyways, um, 
there's, you know, when I think about it from an internal perspective, it's it's really uh, both looking and challenging our, our leaders to say the talent that you have, how are you growing them? How are you promoting them? How are we nurturing them? And so I think that's that that has to be a huge part of this conversation because oftentimes we we focus on the acquisition part, but sometimes I think for us is is what else are we doing for those that are inside? Um, but but uh, from an external perspective, um, you know, again, just echoing some of the things that my partner said, it's there, there's work that we've been doing, um, but what other work is happening outside of us, and where is there partnership that we can learn? Um, from and and um, engage with and so we've got um currently um a, a couple different partners um there's a large consortium that kind of was um erected called the minnesota business coalition on on racial equity and so just kind of hearing from other partners of, of what people are doing has has really really been helpful um we don't have our own kind of ERGs, so so it's kind of working with what what else is outside that we can partner with or or help our our employees inside to to be engaged. Um, our diverse employees, uh, the Center for Economic Inclusion is also a partner that's kind of helped us think about talent in a broader perspective. In in terms of um, you know all of us kind of have our plans, our strategic plans, but again being a little bit more deliberate with 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 what kinds of plans are going to work how are you helping and translating to your to your um to, for us our organization when we say we want to increase our our black talent and black professionals what does that look like what are the numbers and who's accountable for those for those numbers so um i i also think that that there's something really uh important when you think about engaging diverse talent, particularly in financial services where representation is often very uh, small, is how are we supporting those who are diverse in the banking industry that are that oftentimes are only, right? Because uh, when you look at some of the research from McKinsey and others, there, there's, there's something about being an only in this space. And so um, providing that sponsorship, that and 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 mentorship and also just support so that we can we can grow those individuals. Greg, what are your thoughts? Um, I'll, I'll be really brief, Latoya, because I, I, I don't know that, I, I think that we will all is sort of say yes to, to what each other is saying, because I think we all, you know, uh, practice many of the same things and um, in many cases are probably even, you know, recruiting the same people at the same places oftentimes, you know, so, um, but uh, which is which is cool. And, you know, there's this thing called the the financial services pipeline, Latoya out of Chicago, which I know you're very familiar with. Uh, so that was my plug for the, for the Chicago financial services pipeline um, that we're involved in that I think is a really cool effort. So I would just cite that as a great example in addition to what's already been said, is I think our industry has to begin to have conversations earlier um, in much the way that I think the tech industry has done really successfully. Um, you know, our, our industry has a well-earned history of, of mistrust and, you know, going all the way back to the Freedmen's Bank. And and uh, I think for, for the industry, it's really important to come to terms with that and, you know, be very um, transparent about you know the the notion that um, you know we we th th there is incredible careers and this notion of understanding the importance of wealth and the role that financial services plays and in greater prosperity for all of us is a narrative that I don't think we as an industry have really done a good job and so as a reformed uh, marketer um, I think this notion of changing the narrative is something that our industry really really is craving. Clever. Additional thoughts? Yeah, I'll focus on I'll focus on because I think a, a lot of good points have been made. So I'll focus mostly on how we're engaging talent internally. Uh, about forty percent of Wells Fargo is diverse across a um, racial and ethnic lines. And one of the things that 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 we believe very strongly, and I'm sure my colleagues do as well, if you have been around this DNI work, I think you learn two things. 
maybe three. Number one, you need to be humble. Number two, you need to listen a lot. And then number three, you can never really declare victory because it takes many, many, many years for you to achieve sustained progress. So on the topic of listening, we have created uh, two or three things that have been really, really helpful uh, so far. Number one, and I'm sure others do as well, we have monthly so surveys across all employees and then culminating with, with an annual survey. And in those surveys, we are now asking very direct questions on GNI. Questions along the lines of, do you believe that Wells Fargo supports diversity in the workplace? Do you believe that your manager creates an inclusive environment? Do you believe that you can bring yourself to full self to work? And very direct questions. And then we obviously assess the responses in the data um, by ethnicity and gender and the intersectionality. And it has been very revealing to get a sense as to how the employee population is feeling around diversity. That's one, one point. The second one is that we have a hotline that we call loudspeaker that is not dedicated to DNI. It is mostly for any employee at any point in time on a confidential manner to give us any type of feedback or suggestion or anything. And then we do some uh, analytics behind the scenes as a group of project managers that tag each one of those suggestions, feedbacks that comes from employees. And there is one tag that it is GNI. And if it is GNI, it gets routed to my team. And then we study the trends, the themes, and informs our activities. And then the third one that started with, uh, with Charlie, with our CEO before I joined, and we have kept that because it has been a really, really good thing is the concept of solutions for the community that is designed by the community. So we have been engaging a group of executives and that meets monthly with Charlie, with me, and with members of the operating committee. And uh, we have a group of about 65 African-American executives across functions and businesses and geographies at Wells Fargo. We meet monthly with them they propose initiatives to enhance the African-American employee experience at Wells Fargo. And we select the ones that we can implement, we implement and we give them uh, monthly updates on how, how, how those initiatives are going. And we have a similar forum with about 55 Latino executives and one with another 50 or 55 AAPI executives, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders. So that becomes a very interesting way for us to develop tailored strategies, frankly, be head accountable as an operating committee and create this dialogue by which half of the time in each one of those monthly meetings is mostly Q&A. So they can ask any questions and, uh, and it really allows us to know exactly how they are thinking about their experience uh, at Wells Fargo has been very eye-opening and really productive. So clearly you all are doing a number of things to, to move the needle in this space. But if we were to bring it down, what are three things you would want to see happen to increase diversity in the talent pipeline? So three things. Greg, let's start with you. I think number one, um, Latoya, is it just, there has to be some intentionality uh, around it. And I think, you know, for most, uh, in any initiative in, in any organization, um, there's got to be um, a certain level of intentionality. And with that intentionality, um, I would say is accountability. So I would say that's number one. Um, uh, Colette uh, talked about this a little bit earlier. I think number two is we can't lose focus on those employees who are currently in the organization. So I think we've got to continue to focus on growth and development of those that are in the organization um, I think our industry has a tendency to want uh, to want to buy the talent and not grow uh, the talent that we have. And I think there is nothing that creates a culture of um, a healthy culture um, like growing and retaining your own talent. And I think the current um, labor market is going to present some really interesting challenges, not only for our industry, but for others. And this notion of being able to develop your own is going to be critical. So promotion rates. And the third one might be a little bit surprising. Again, I think 
Um, you know, I, I, I think a lot in terms of brands and, and brand. And, um, you know, one of the things I think is critical is that um, our industry has to just do business with minority owned businesses. And I'm not talking about through supplier diversity programs. I'm talking about, you know, things like really focusing on private equity investment and, and making investments outside of philanthropy and community um, so that um, communities really start to see that um, organizations like all of ours on this call um, are really committed in a very real way to building healthy communities because I don't think people um, I, I, I don't think people buy things I think they buy into ideas and they buy into um, from an employment perspective they buy into your why not your what um, there is a lot of commodity uh, commoditization in our industry and I think where um, organizations can continue to create um, greater affinity is through this notion of what's your why what's your purpose um, and so I'd love to see us talk more about the why we do things and not necessarily the what in terms of products and services. Um, so that was probably more than five, more than three, but I'll just leave it right there. We can lump them in the three somehow. Okay, deal. Clever, what are the three things that rise for you? I want to I wanna, I wanna pick up on, on Greg's second point, which for me is a really, really important one. How do we grow and develop talent that is internal, that is already in the banking system? And um, a lot of them, at least the time that I spend with, with the ones uh, at Wells Fargo, I'm sure is the same in other institutions as well. They want to grow. They are very talented. They want to be seen and they want to be mentored and they want to be trained. But the, but the raw talent is absolutely there. And it is a win-win because you provide career opportunities for them. They already understand your culture. They understand uh, the, uh, the industry. They are the ones serving customers. So we, we have been really focused on that. And I think in my mind, it comes down to two things in addition to what Greg has said. Number one, uh, training programs. How do we equip them with the skills that they're gonna need to grow professionally? And, uh, and it requires, frankly, resources and focus, but it's not that hard. Like we can train um, um, employees to become very successful managers and progress and is a good thing for for our shareholders, I think for society is a good thing for them. And then secondly, mentorship. A lot of times, diverse talent lack the network that majority groups have. And many times they feel invisible because of that. And we have been trying very intentionally to pair some of our diverse talent with operating committee members, with senior executives as part of formal mentorship programs and the sponsorship programs that creates that visibility and creates also implicitly some accountability on those senior executives to truly help those diverse um, employees achieve some career progression. I think career mobility is the theme that we hear more consistently from our own employees and it's something that we have really tried to focus on. Colette, your thoughts? Yeah, I'll just add to what Cleaver and, and Greg have said, particularly around the idea of, um, of engaging talent that's not al already here. And so that's starting uh, before joining Bremer, I, used to, I was in higher education. And I can think about the number of conversations I've, I've had with students and, and, and typically people go into careers that they have seen their parents or others that they know of in. And so we have to start the conversation a lot earlier in terms of career development. And we've got just this, you know, probably really extraordinary um, opportunity to, to do that. In our footprint, it, it, well, in Minnesota, in, in particular, I think the um, BIPOC graduates in 2019, I think it was like 36%, right? So 36% of our graduates coming out of the college and university system in Minnesota is that high, how do we start helping people um, just consider or think about financial services? And, and even, I mean, all of us in the organizations we work in, it, it might not necessarily be um, banking, it could be marketing like Greg talked about or HR, but kind of getting into the industry and then, and then tra transferring. So I think um, 
there's there's other ways of kind of engaging and, and getting some curiosity of of talent um, and diverse talent to to be a part of our organizations. I would say also, um, you know, maybe just helping our um, and shifting some of the responsibility of diverse talent and, and the entry point having to come from our, our HR teams or our TA teams to putting and shifting some of that accountability just to our leaders in, in general and managers about who they're, who is in their network and who is not. Um, I know even for us, as simple as just our, our internship programs uh, and, and being intentional about having some some specific measures there because oftentimes those folks get to transfer and, and be a part of the um, the you know the the FTEs in the future. And then um, I think lastly, my my third point would just be the the c continuing the um, you know the the sense of urgency that has been displayed in the last uh, eighteen months. How do we make sure that that doesn't die down? Because it's the fact of the matter is the the talent that's going to increasingly be available is going to be diverse talent. And if we don't start getting them in now, we're already we're already too far back. So we've got to we've got to not only we've got to not just stay consistent, but really ramp it up if we're going to to really make some kind of impact. And Colette, if I can just sorry, if I can just add one thing to your point, uh, which I agree with. Also, how do we make financial services more attractive to younger generations? Because a lot of times we don't get to see them because they don't view banking as a place that they believe can be um, a good career track for them. Yeah, I think even one thing we can do is just help them understand the lucrative nature. I mean, one one thing that we learned from the pandemic was the reason that communities of color were so disproportionately impacted was because the representation in hospitality, in um, healthcare, and you know, in any kind of service was disproportionately people of color. Those of us in professional IT finance positions and, and industries were not were impacted but but not like that right and so and even just the wage gap of in those other industries you know they're making under 30,000 where in in financial services that's you know especially in professional level jobs you're not you're not making that so that's part of the storytelling i think that we have to help our aspiring professionals understand kianga what are the three things that you would like to see happen um, well, they've really mentioned them all, but I'll just elaborate a little bit on, on them. Um, you know, she just mentioned that we need to change the narrative of, you know, working in the financial services or banking area. I don't think that, um, I think for, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a degree or have 20 years of experience to work in the field, or at least to even enter into, into the field. You know, it's, it's a technical job, but a lot of that takes place, you know, on the job. So I think people feel like when they're looking at, you know, the the job description that, you know, maybe I don't have the qualities or the skills to get in it. I think we need to rewrite those to make it make those job descriptions um, say, you know, you do have the characteristics, you do have the qualities, you do have the ability to apply. Um, so I think we also need to make banking seem like a more meaningful career, right? Because we all want to feel fulfilled in our jobs, in our lives. And I think the perception for a lot of people now could be like the monopoly guy with the top hat and, you know, he's not looking out for society. I think most of us know here in this, in this Zoom, we know that, you know, it feels good to get people in college. It feels good to provide loans to small businesses and things like that. So I think maybe if we shared those rewards that we get, um, you know, that might entice more people. Um, and then also, I, you know, we need to teach kids much younger than in high school, especially minorities and low income children. Um, we teach them about, you know, becoming firemen or police officers or teachers, but no one's walking around saying you could be the bank president. I think, you know, once we introduce that to them, you know, they'll have that in their arsenal of when someone's ready to ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, they're ready to say, I want to be a banker. <laughs> so um, we need to start that conversation much, much sooner than high school. 
Latoya, can I, I build have, what go Keanu, ahead, Greg. Go ahead. Can I build what Kianga said? Because there's so much in there that I really love. And I, I think it's absolutely a shame that any kid graduates high school and hasn't taken a financial literacy course. Like, I just, I don't understand why, you know, we teach basic skills and why understanding financial education, financial literacy is not part of a core curriculum. It's just a basic life skill. I think that fundamentally to Kianga's point, you know, and, and to me, I don't, I don't know that, and I could be wrong because all of you are probably more of a banker than I am, but I, I don't know that anybody grows up saying they want to be a banker. I think people grow up saying, like, I want to understand how to build wealth, or I want to stand, understand how to help people build wealth, or I want to understand. And I think if you say to kids, you know, what about a career in financial services? They think about banking. So they think about, you know, the person behind the desk that they might take their passbook account up to and they go, eh, I don't know that I want to do that. Or, you know, even like nobody wants to be a cashier at Target necessarily, right? Like, and so you think about change, as I said before, changing the narrative is, hey, do you want to understand how to build wealth or do you want to understand how to how to manage money better? That's a different conversation you know, with a young person than saying, do you want to be in financial services? So I just say yes to what all of my panelists said. And I just think that the narrative that our industry has needs a makeover. So I think we have uh, time for one more, um, if I can get quick responses from the panelists before we open up to some audience questions. You all have mentioned it in uh, the threads of your responses, but how would we go about reaching out to those late millennials and Gen Zs, um, including diverse members of that group, who may not consider banking uh, as, a, as, a, as a career option. How are you thinking about that? Clever, I'll start with you. In some ways, I, I just I'll pick up again on what on Greg, uh, Greg and Kianga said before. You, number one, you need to create a narrative. Like banking has the ability, if done appropriately, if done right, to really positively impact people's lives. And a lot of the younger generations, they do have that aspiration. They do wanna uh, help others. And I think banking can, can enable that. And we need to tell that story. Secondly, to use the channels that they use the most to go meet them where they are. Like younger generations don't watch TV nearly as frequently as certainly I watch or they don't read the newspapers like as often as, that's not how they consume news, but they have a variety of channels, social media, TikTok, um, in some cases, YouTube, but meet them where they are versus trying to like leverage existing channels that for that generation may be obsolete. Uh, and then lastly, you have to develop a presence on campus. Like we need to go and have longer conversations and be open for questions that they may have, and that requires us being uh, present on campus. And uh, to the point that was made before by Colette, not only um, in colleges, but in some cases, obviously you gotta be careful in, on an appropriate basis, um, high school as well, secondary education as well. Colette, how are you engaging that community? I can get off. I could get off of mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I, I would just, I would echo just, the, it's the, I think it's really the side door. I think it's, it's, um, it's being in spaces that maybe aren't as intentional. It's, it's being at your coffee shop or your wine bar, listening to conversations. And, and I think it's a little, it's just really natural. Like, what are you, what do you care about? And, and helping kind of align and, 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 and helping people see where there's possibility or entry points into financial services. I don't. I don't necessarily think it's um, it, it's is as much of a of a science as it is an art. I think it's um, you know my coffee shop or I'm remote mostly, but when I go in, I mean, there's people that I form relationships with, and I. I think for any role, there's kind of three ingredients. Are people hungry? Are they humble? And do they have hustle? <laughs> like those are the, the skills and how, and how are those transferable? And so I think it's, 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 um, I think it's really about listening to people and what they're interested and curious about and then helping them imagine possibility for themselves in financial services. 
Tiaga, how are your uh, banks reaching that community? Um, you, I would echo the same thing that I just talked about. Um, social media, um, you know, and networking, finding networking opportunities for them, uh, you know, finding the professional organizations that we talked about earlier. And Greg? Um, yes to everything everybody said, and I, I would, you know, maybe just offer that I think, um, you know, if, if people don't trust institutions, they trust other people. And I think, you know, we have to do a better job of like highlighting people in the industry, you know, who are doing this work. I mean, I look at um, Colette and, right, and, you know, Claver and, you know, how do we make sure that people see these incredible um, executives who come from the same places that they that they come from, you know, doing this job and make it look cool. You know what I mean? Like Calabria seems like a cool guy. We haven't met yet, but you know, like he's a cool dude. And Colette, I know, who's super cool. And Kiang, I can tell like you're awesome. And like, like how do we put a spotlight on these people who have the same lived experience that they have and show them doing these jobs? Like that's what makes people want to do it. They find someone who is inspiring. As I said, nobody really trusts institutions of any kind, but they trust other people who have shared experience and shared lived experience and it'll make them consider it. So I say put a spotlight, more of a spotlight on the people who are in the industry that come from these same communities. Thank you. We do have a few questions from the participants, the audience, so I'm going to move to a couple of those. Um, and hopefully in our remaining 10 minutes or so, we can get through those. So one of those questions is, have you successfully cultivated diverse talent? And also, have you seen things that have not been effective? Um, Greg, maybe I'll start with you. Oh, thanks, Atoy. I had to do the quick. Um, I'm sorry, repeat the question. Have we cultivated diverse talent and? Right, and have you seen things that have not been effective? Yeah, my gosh, how much time do we have? You know, like nobody's like, I love the question. It's like, who's doing it well? Well, nobody's doing it well because none of us would be here if we were doing it well, right? Like, like there's so much opportunity and yes, we're all making progress. I mean, everybody's making progress, but you know, the point is, and I think Claver, you said this early, it's not a destination. Like we, we're all sort of um, in it because of the journey and that's been the history you know, of this country for that matter. Like we're all on this destination to a better future together. And, you know, yes, we've, you know, we're cultivating diverse talent, but we have so much work to do. And, you know, much like Claiborne and, you know, you know, sometimes it's, it's making very bold strokes, like, um, you know, him joining the operating committee at, at Wells Fargo, I'm on the operating committee here at US Bank. But I think what's important about that is, and I hope you feel this way, Claiborne, it's like, you, we can't be, we can't a we can't be the only one and i want to get to the point where we're no longer the first like i want to get to a point where there's you're not the first black or latino or woman to do x and so i think that's the work to be done so the short answer is yes we're certainly cultivating the talent um but my gosh that list of things that we could be doing better is incredibly long and that's the hard work that all of us on this call are doing hmm. Thank you. Colette? Well, I unmuted, so you wouldn't have to all experience <laughs> that again. Um, I, I, I think the only thing I would add is um, that it, there's a real intentionality, I think, even more than before about putting people with the right leaders. Because, um, and in addition, um, making our, our leadership um, preparedness and competencies, DEI being uh, an imperative competency if you're going to be a leader. Because um, I, think, I think that's one of the biggest pieces that just doesn't work for folks. If we're bringing people in and not, they're not in either the right, the right leadership or kind of community to thrive, then that's that that's where things kind of really fall apart. And so there has to be um, a considerable more intentionality around that. Clever, your thoughts on that? 
I don't I don't have a whole lot to add. I think like well, certainly one of the things that I, I, I that I don't believe it works, and, and Greg said it, so let me just say it like slightly differently, is that a lot of times executives they do want to do the work. But their definition of doing the work is to find somebody who's gonna do it for them. And the reality is D and I is a contact sport. You need to do it personally. Like one of the things, frankly, that I that I that I very much appreciated um, with Charlie, which I had not met before taking the job, and given the pandemic, I had not met in person before taking the job, like eleven months ago, is that he is engaged. Like he shows up to a bunch of the meetings that 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 we run, and that's helpful because then he can listen directly on the issues versus having a translator um, that 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 is never the same. So, and and I've seen this. Um, in a lot of different venues that people equate doing the work on GNI as let me go find the GNI expert. And it's not how this work goes to be effective. Well, that's a keeper. DEI is a contact sport. Kianga, you have thoughts here? Sorry about that. So um, I would just go back to my own personal experience of um, having a mentor. Um, I started out as an assistant for the association and, you know, someone took me under their wing and she mentored me and guided me and spoke to me. Um, and she let me test my ideas out on her. So, you know, I, before she threw me out there to swim, I could, you know, go back and forth with what I was doing or working on with her. Um, and then also I, I had a second mentor who really pushed me extremely hard. And I think, you know, I don't know how to describe that he pushed me to a next level, but he made me accountable. So I just know that mentoring, you know, having someone that knows how to mentor and someone who's ready to be mentored, you know, it's the perfect thing to, to, to bring more diversity together, I mean, to the industry. So, so thank you all. This has been a, a rich discussion. And as many of you have pointed out, um, you know, we could, we could probably talk for another hour or two, especially if we were to, to you know, delve into um, things that we might do differently, given some of the things that, that have been tried um, that, that haven't uh, worked as we hoped. But we have DE&I as a contact sport. We clearly understand from your comments that many of you are, you know, doing a number of things to try to holistically, you know, tackle this and your efforts are very much geared toward moving the needle. One of the other things that jumped out at me is that we have an opportunity with where we are, and hopefully we will keep the momentum to tell a different story and to reach out to broader audiences that may not be paying attention to financial services, um, but who could in fact do very well in this arena. So Colette, Greg, Kianga, Clever, thank you all for making me smarter. Thank you all for engaging in the discussion. I hope uh, everyone has uh, been as enlightened as I have been, as I've had the chance to talk with you. And with that, I will hand things back to Kristen. Thank you so much, LaToya. And I would again like to thank each of our panelists for joining us and for that engaging discussion. Tomorrow, we will wrap up the week with our last two sessions. We hope you'll join us from 10 to 11 a.m. Central Time for an engaging presentation on authenticity from Caroline Wenger. Also, stick around immediately after for our closing and post-forum plan session from 11 to 11.45 Central Time. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you tomorrow.